I was looking for like something I could do like little bits and pieces on when we had these shows. And I said, well, we, we come back to the same formulas over and over again. And it's pretty important to know some of these things. So here we are. We have airflow formula and cooling capacity. And these are pretty much related because if you can see, we have the very top airflow equation or formula, whatever is CFM equals BTU sensible divided by Delta T times 1.08. Well, if you go down to the cooling capacity, the sensible cooling heating formula, whatever you're going to talk about here uh, with cooling, you know, you have a negative Delta T, I guess. And then uh, heating, you have a positive Delta T, so to speak, if you're going from return to supply, but take a look down at cooling capacity, look at BTU sensible. It's CFM times Delta T times 1.08. So it's really pretty simple if you are working on something that doesn't produce you know, any latent change. Oh man, I just looked down in the chat and I realize that Brandon has new internet. I wanna congratulate Brandon Brenny from the Midwest, the upper Midwest for finally getting that super internet. He can actually come on the show, not be pixelated now. It's gonna be great, Brandon. We're gonna have so much fun together. It'll be a lot of fun, man. So I just can't wait. So we'll get back to this now. So let's say you had, I hate to do this. I can bring up the, uh, my calculator on my phone here, but we're going to do like a little mock thing here just to go over how easy it is to get these calculations correct. Even if you're doing like a, like a gas furnace or something like that, we use gas furnace right there because all of our latent or all of our cooling is going to involve some kind of latent. So it's going to go to the equation right below this one. Not the sensible, but the BTU of total. I'm trying to just talk while I find my calculator. Okay, so BTU sensible. So let's say we have a gas furnace. Let's say it's pushing out 1000 CFM. The delta T is 35, so we're multiplying by 35. Then we multiply again by 1.08. And what we have is 37,800 BTUs. And it's just that simple. So if you have those measurements, you can do that if you get your CFM and it works in reverse too. So if you have, and you could even kind of guesstimate if you have an output that you know, and you can work backwards to get your CFM, just like they do in the very top one there for airflow. So it's, it's pretty cool. You can use these quite a bit. This one right here, like I said, it's just for sensible. So let's try another one here. Again, we're looking at BTUs equal CFM times Delta T, which is change in temperature. Just your dry bulb temperature times 1.08. So let's try, let's try 2000 CFM, like a five ton, no five ton. Let's, let's be realistic. 1700 CFM times a Delta T of, let's say it gets up to 40, 40, getting a little bit higher times 1.08. That's 73,440. So with all that, it only equals 73,000. There's furnaces out there that are 115,000, 120,000 residential furnaces. I do believe they go all the way up to 120. You guys can tell me if they go higher than that. I don't see a whole lot of furnaces out there, but perhaps they do. I'm not sure. So even if you have something where like the Delta T is higher, which, which is probably the case. So let's take that same 1,700. So Brandon says 140, 140,000 BTU. So let's take 1,750 and a delta T of 50 times 1.08. So that gets us all the way up to 94,000. So you see that delta gets pretty high because the CFM ain't going much higher than that. So I want to backtrack. I'm kind of curious now because these furnaces are supposed to go to 140. Let's see what it takes to actually do that. So we'll get 1800 CFM times, let's see, times 60 times 1.08. And that's 116,000. So now we're getting the neighborhood of these outputs that are really, really high. And you can kind of understand why maybe a lot of these are oversized <laughs> because that is a lot of heating. That is a heck of a lot of heating. I've never seen a house here that had a zone or a whole house, whatever, however it was zoned, whether it's the whole house or a wing of a huge house or whatever. I've never seen one with a capacity that high. I don't think I shouldn't say that because there's probably one out there I've done, but I don't recall. So that's just one way to use the sensible heat formula. So let's step down one below it. We're not going to do BTUs of latent because frankly, 
grains per pound is something that we're not going to get into very much on the fly. That doesn't really happen. And I actually want to study it a little bit more anyway, like how much water comes out of the air, things like that. So before I say something about latent, I want to make sure I do my homework too. So BTU total. So let's say we have a cooling system. Cooling system is, and we're talking about BTUs equals CFM times 4.5 times delta H. So instead of delta T this time, we have delta H. So, and let's go to Brandon says, Adam from Overtime talks all the time about downsizing furnaces in Chicago from 80,000 to 40,000. See, that makes a lot of sense. I don't know what the design temperature in Chicago is, but I assume it's somewhere between zero and 10 degrees Fahrenheit for the winter time. And even at that lower design temperature, ours is 20, you're still gonna have good grief. It's gonna be hard to reach those really high BTU outputs that furnaces come in. They are expecting, and let me come off the screen here. They are expecting, I think, for you to have a very leaky, awful house. And as houses get updated and get tighter and tighter, and constructed better and better, I think you were going to have issues with not needing all those huge furnaces and maybe they'll go away a little bit or be less prevalent out there or just less available, like most of the things now anyway. So it's, uh, oh, Brandon says it's minus five. Well, I didn't know it was that low. Okay. So even at minus five, that's 25 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than here, it would be very difficult to justify something that's 140,000 BTUs. You're going to have to have like a palatial estate with one zone to have 140,000 BTUs, it would be incredible. And I don't think it's gonna happen here at all. But you know, you still see it. Because gas packs, and that's a whole different question we could talk about. Actually, let's take a, a minute here. Gas packs come in fixed sizes. You don't have that variability that you have with a furnace and a coil. Because a furnace, you can say, I want an 80,000 BTU furnace, but I need a three ton coil, or I need a two and a half ton coil, or whatever it is. You can mix and match, or maybe you only need a 40,000 BTU furnace, but you need a three-ton coil because the loads are different. With the gas pack, you get, because a lot of times you're dealing with whatever brand you sell, you get what they have. So you might have a five-ton gas pack that comes in 115,000 BTUs and 90,000 BTUs, but you won't have anything smaller. Or you might have a four-ton that comes in 90,000 and 75,000 or something like that. And it works your way down, so you don't have exactly what you need. So that becomes problematic. I actually ran into a system. Oh my gosh. It was a guy who installed his own system and it was, it was done really, really well. It was like the engineer sort of deal where the engineer comes in and works on his own stuff, but it's like everything is extremely level. All everything's hung with like a threaded rod hanger. I mean, it's really, really nice, really top notch, but it was 115,000 BTU gas pack and it just couldn't run. It was two stages too. Let me let me go back and say that it's two stages of cooling and heating. I believe it was Goodman or Amana. It was a Goodman product. We had to end up disabling the second stage because it couldn't run in second stage because it was just overheating. It was literally overheating because the ductwork couldn't handle the delta T that I was putting out. It was just getting too hot. I don't know if it was limiting. I don't remember if it was going off on limit, but I remember it was just excessive and cooling too. It was five tons in cooling and it's pretty rare to need five tons of cooling in a house. It's going to have to be a pretty big house or a house with like just like no insulation, which does happen. But if you're spending the money to get an air conditioner, usually people are spending money to do a few upgrades because you can make a few simple upgrades of insulation, even if it's only in like the ceiling where you can reach and rarely you have to get five tons out of it. So we had to disable the second stage. So it's uh, just one of those things. It's what you do. It's, it's not perfect, but it's the real world. That's it. Hashtag real world HVAC guys, real world HVAC, which is fine with me. I mean, I enjoyed stuff like that, trying to figure out problems and having atypical solutions. Hey, it works for me. So let's bring this thing back up here. Okay. So we were doing cooling capacity. Let's move on to that. And these are really easy, guys. And this is all over the internet. You can find these everywhere. CFM times 4.5. And that's going to be your total cooling capacity. Latent and sensible. CFM times 4.5 times delta H. Now, we've talked about delta H and delta T. Delta T is your sensible temperature. 
That's like your furnace is taking in 70 degree air and it's putting out 115 degree air. You have a 45 degree delta T. With delta H, you're taking into account that latent cooling that you're going to be doing. It's your total heat instead of just your sensible heat. So with delta H, you're going to have to have something that either measures relative humidity as well as the sensible temperature, or you're just going to have to have something that measures enthalpy directly, which is the easiest way to go. That's what I would suggest. There's a lot of things that, you know, that can monitor and measure this that are under $100. I, know that, I don't know if the field piece pin hygrometer does. I know the UEI does. The DTH35, I believe, is what it is. I always like that one. It was awesome. Under $100, measures enthalpy. You either have to have two of them, though, or just move the same one. Probably get two of them. And there's a whole lot of the smart probes that measure enthalpy and the field piece stuff. Like the, I don't remember what it's called. Dual Induct Psychrometer, I think. It would do Delta H. So you have that Delta H. You measure that, or you can calculate it. You can use an app to calculate it from getting other measurements, like the Fahrenheit and relative humidity and stuff. You can calculate it. You can plot it out on the psychometric chart, but no one's doing that. Yeah, let's take the psychometric chart to work with us. That sounds like a sexy, fun time. So you get your Delta H. It's usually going to be, you know, the average... If it's 400 CFM, it's going to be 6.7 or so. So if everything's perfect, and let's follow me here. Let's say you have a 1,000 CFM, which is typical of a two and a half ton machine at 400 CFM, and you multiply that by 4.5, and then you multiply that by a delta H of 6.7, you get 30,150. It's just a little bit higher because the actual average delta H would be 6.67 or six and two thirds. We just round up to 6.7. So what can you assume if your delta H is higher or lower than 6.7? Well, one thing you can assume if you go into a job and you're just measuring enthalpy in and out, just like if you're measuring sensible temperature in and out over a coil and it's higher Instead of a delta H of 6.67, it's 7.5 or 8, getting really, really high. Then you could have a low airflow situation. So you measure your CFM. Your CFM might come out at 350 per ton or 325 per ton. Then you can make adjustments if possible. So you can spot some issues pretty early on. Just like if you know my little relative humidity rule of thumb. Like if you have a relative humidity that is in the comfort zone of 50%, 55%, you know your temperature split sensible should be somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. If it gets to be 22, 23 degrees Fahrenheit, you know there's an issue with airflow, most likely. If it's lower than that, it could be excess airflow. If you got some kind of miracle unicorn system that has excess airflow, which it does happen, or there's a failure in the system, like a refrigerant leak or TXV failure, just some sort of failure that diminishes the capacity of the system. You know, any number of failures can cause that. And any number of things can cause low airflow. But you can spot it pretty easily by seeing what the temperature is across a coil. And it might be one of them things where it's on purpose. You know, a lot of people have these purposeful things they do to get more humidity out of the air. If you have a high relative humidity and you can't get it down, you might lower the blower speed, and that's going to raise your target delta T of delta H and delta T, actual delta sensible. So you could see that be affected by the way technicians have set up a system. And if you have a system that runs at 350 per ton, it's not going to fit this mold exactly either. So there's plenty of systems out there that are high efficiency systems. We talked about it before that you have to drop it down to 350 a ton. And when you do that, it's going to affect the delta T and delta H. So you're going to have all that stuff come into play. The capacity is going to change. The sensible heat ratio is going to change. And that's just how much sensible cooling is done compared to latent cooling. It changes. You lower the blower speed, you get more latent cooling and less sensible cooling. That's why when you have that really, really hot and humid day, that target temperature drop across the coil goes way down because it's having to treat all that latent load that's in a house. And you know, I was going to talk about this too. So we'll wrap this up. I have something else I'm going to talk about. Get your opinion on it, guys. And we can talk about that as well. 
But that's just a couple of the formulas right there. And I think that's a couple of the ones that, you know, it's pretty easy to just run through those real quick, especially the heating one. The heating one's real easy because everybody's got a thermometer. We don't all necessarily have something that can measure enthalpy, but almost all of us have something that measures just standard dry bulb temperature. Even if you take some kind of stupid analog dial or something, you can get a rough idea, especially on a furnace, because the bigger the target is, the easier it's going to be to measure with an analog dial. If you're doing like a air conditioner, it may not be quite as easy because you might be looking at 12 degrees, whereas a furnace, you might be looking at 40 degrees. So if you're a couple of degrees off, it's not a big deal on a furnace. It's pretty close, but on an air conditioner, that could be significant, a significant data malfunction. <laughs> If you want to watch more videos just like this one, click on this playlist right here. If you want to see our brand new video, click right here. If you want to find out more about the great sponsors that make this show happen, click up here. And to join our email list where I notify you when we're going live, click right here.